Good morning. Uh, it is always a privilege to be back with you and worship the Lord alongside you. Uh, it's like a, a little family reunion every time. Um, and that is such because we are family in the Lord, regardless of wherever we're located. And so, again, I appreciate um, your two former pastors that I was here at the BCV under, uh, Brother Harry and Brother Jake, and I appreciate and love your current pastor as well, Brother Corey, and what a privilege to stand in for my brother. And so what I want to do this morning is talk about the sure return of Christ. The king has come, the king has died, the king is risen, and the king will come again. We're going to be in a sort of a kaleidoscope of text. And so if you have your Bible, and I hope you do, we're going to be flipping. And so the first text is Acts chapter 1, verses 9 and 11. It's going to describe the nature of Christ's return. It says this in verse 9. And when he had said these things, as they were looking on, he, that is Jesus, was lifted up, and a cloud took him out of their sight. And while they were gazing into heaven as he went, behold, two men stood by them in white robes. Verse 11, men of Galilee, why do you stand looking into heaven? This Jesus, who was taken up from you into heaven, will come in the same way as you saw him go into heaven. The return of Christ here is going to be a bodily, a visible, personal, authoritative, and majestic return. And so the goal this morning uh, is not for us to pick up our diagrams, our maps, our charts, to start pinpointing dates, times, and seasons. The goal here about talking on this subject is that we would roll up our sleeves, pick up our cross, and get to work until the king returns. Um, The issue of end times, eschatology, last things, it's, it's one of those areas in the church where there is just so much variety. Uh, And unfortunately, there's a lot of uh, false teaching. Um, And in our day, it's really not talked about often enough. Um, It's kind of like, you know, talking to your children about sexual things when they're younger. If you avoid the conversation, it's not that they won't have any ideas. It's that they'll have a lot of bad ideas. It's the same thing when we talk about the end. We have to discuss it. We have to search the scriptures and see what the Lord has or we'll probably have a lot of bad ideas. The scriptures have a lot to say in this area. And so with that being said, let's pray that the Lord would bless our endeavor here as we search those holy words. Pray with me, please. Father, we thank you for your word. We thank you, God, that you have not left us groping in the dark, even about something as important as the end. Lord, we pray that you would open our eyes to see wonderful things in your law. God, we pray as we discuss something as weighty and as important as your glorious, bodily, majestic return, God, that it would affect us. That this wouldn't just be us gaining head knowledge, but that we would want to obey your word all the more. That we would want to work and labor, hastening the day of the Lord, as Peter says. And so, God, help us to be found faithful this morning as we search your scriptures. We pray this in Jesus' mighty and precious name. Amen. Amen. And so I want to give you a couple reasons of why we should preach on this subject before we talk about the subject itself. And so here's the first reason why we have to think about the end. And so the first reason is it helps us understand God's game plan for the universe. It helps us understand God's game plan for the universe. Listen to 1 Peter 4, 7. The end of all things is at hand. Therefore, be self-controlled and sober-minded for the sake of your prayers. The end of all things is at hand. Or Hebrews 1, 1 and 2 says, Long ago and at many times and in many ways, God spoke to our fathers by the prophets. But in these last days, He has spoken to us by His Son, whom He appointed the heir of all things, through whom all Also, he created the world. And so, so often people ask me, are we we living in the end times? Are we living in the last days? And the answer is yes. But we've been living in those last days since Pentecost, since the resurrection of Christ. I mean, the writers of the Bible have salvation history in mind. Creation, fall, the flood, the calling of Abraham, Israel, 
the prophets crying out in the wilderness, the incarnation, life, death, and resurrection of Jesus. So in terms of God's plan for the universe, the second coming is the next big thing. That's what the Bible is talking about and aiming for. Uh, that's what we mean when we say we're in the last days. It could happen at any moment. Jesus' ascension and pouring out of his good spirit ushered in the end of days. And so preaching about this helps us understand that. Secondly, it will help us melt the lead in our shoes. It will help us melt the lead in our shoes. 1 Corinthians 15, 58 says this, Therefore, my beloved brothers, be steadfast, immovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord, knowing that in the Lord your labor is not in vain. In light of the second coming, we need to be laboring for the Lord. We need to be getting ourselves, our families, and then our sphere of influence ready for the sure return of Christ. Um, one writer said, our, our Father refreshes us on this journey with many pleasant inns, many pleasant hotels, but He will not encourage us to mistake them for our home. This world is not our home yet. Brothers and sisters, if we love the world, if we become like the world, if we live like the world lives, we will never reach the world for Christ. We have work to do. And so preaching on the second coming will help melt the lead in our feet and cause us to get to work. The third reason why we should think about this, help encourage us. Uh, brothers and sisters, it is gloriously dark outside. And I'm not talking about the sun being up right now. I'm talking about where we're at in our country, where we're at in our states, school shootings, pandemics, political disarray where you don't even know who to trust, sexual abuse reports in our own denomination, human evil and brokenness breaking out in every area of our lives and society. We need God's encouragement. We need to be reminded that there is one on the throne and he has not abdicated it to anyone. And so preaching on the second coming will encourage us. And then lastly, preaching on the second coming will help us long for his return. Listen to the way the early church talked about the return of Christ. 2 Timothy 4, 7, and 8. This is Paul. I have fought the good fight. I have finished the race. I have kept the faith. Henceforth, there is laid up for me the crown of righteousness, which the Lord, the righteous judge, will award to me on that day. And not only to me, but also to all who have loved his appearing. The early church loved his appearing. Said another way, 1 Corinthians 1, 6, and 8, even as the testimony about Christ was confirmed among you so that you are not lacking in any spiritual gift as you wait for the revealing of our Lord Jesus Christ. So they loved his appearing. They waited for his return. One more, if you'll permit. Hebrews 9, 27, and 28. And just as it is appointed for man to die once and after that face judgment, so Christ having been offered once to bear the sins of many, will appear a second time, not to deal with sin, but to save those who are eagerly waiting for him. And so the, the early church loved the second coming. They waited for the second coming, eagerly waited for the second coming, even hastening that day by laboring for the sake of the kingdom for it. And so the question then before us is, why? Why did the early church have that disposition, that posture towards the return of Christ? What are they waiting for? What are they longing for? And so what I want to do this morning is give you six big things that will occur when Christ returns. These are the reasons, these are the causes behind the church longing for his second coming, not only in the first century, but the last 2,000 years. And I want to say this about the six. These are six things that all Bible-believing Christians affirm. Um, there's probably 86 things about the second coming that there's differences among Bible-believing Christians. And so we're going to focus on the six that we all, as Bible-believing Christians, believe in. And so here's the first one. What happens at his return? The devil is defeated. Sin, evil, and death itself are no more. 
Listen to Revelation 29 and 10. And they marched up over the broad plain of the earth and surrounded the camp of the saints and the beloved city. But fire came down from heaven and consumed them. And the devil who had deceived them was thrown into the lake of fire and sulfur where the beast and false prophet were. And they were tormented day and night forever and ever. A little further in 14 and 15. Then death and Hades were thrown into the lake of fire. This is the second death, the lake of fire. And if anyone's name was not found written in the book of life, he was thrown into the lake of fire. And so there's a lot of apocalyptic language here. The imagery is colorful, flowery, showy. It's jolting on purpose. But the point is clear. When Jesus Christ returns, certain realities will never return again. They will fade away. Satan will be vanquished. Um, you know, and I'll say this, Christians are sometimes looked down upon in our society for believing in a personal devil. But ladies and gentlemen, I, I'm not sure that you can make sense of the mass evil in the world without believing in a personal Satan, believing in a personal devil. I mean, Martin Luther once said, I know the devil is real because I was fighting with him just this morning. And so there is an enemy of our souls who is out there causing and wreaking havoc within the world and attacking the church. But the Scriptures affirm one day He will be destroyed Himself. So we fight against the enemy of our souls. We fight against our sin. We fight against evil, both large and small. But we do this knowing that one day it will all be finished. Even death itself will die. There's coming a day when King Jesus himself will place his boot upon the neck of Satan and crush him forevermore. And, and not just Satan, sin. Sin will be no more. And so I don't know about you, but sometimes, you know, Satan is out there. He's tempting. His foes are attacking, causing temptation, causing disarray. But it's the sin in my own heart that I fear more than him sometimes. It is bone deep in me. And I labor and I fight against it. And yet sometimes there's victory and other times there's not. But the scriptures teach the fight against sin is tiring and wearisome. But the Bible teaches that it will end in the end. Flesh will be crushed and give way to something far more glorious. And so one reason why the early church longed for the return of Christ, sin and Satan will be vanquished. The second reason is connected to the first. The resurrection of the body will occur. Why will there be no more sin? You will be given a resurrected body. Listen to 1 Corinthians 15, verses 50 and 53. Verse 50, I tell you this, brothers, flesh and blood cannot inherit the kingdom of God, nor does the perishable inherit the imperishable. Behold, I tell you a mystery. We shall not all sleep but we shall all be changed in a moment in the twinkling of an eye at the last trumpet. For the trumpet will sound and the dead will be raised imperishable and we shall all be changed. For this perishable body must put on the imperishable and this mortal body must put on immortality. And so the end of history pictures God giving his people resurrected bodies. You know, and, and we run the risk here. We run the danger of always being more spiritual than God. People's picture of the end can so often be fuzzy, sometimes confusing, and many times downright unbiblical. You know, the, the picture is just sitting on a cloud playing a harp. But the goal of creation is for creation to meet its intended goal. God and man will dwell together bodily on the new heavens and the new earth. We will have new resurrected bodies. The trumpet will sound and we will rise from the grave with new resurrected bodies akin to Jesus' resurrected body. And think about the nature of this. The new, these new bodies will not be susceptible to pain, brokenness, disease, or death because the old order of things has passed away. I mean, I'm a young man, about to hit 32, and I've experienced like... Waking up after, after sleeping wrong the night before and having aches that I did not know could exist in my body. 
I mean, and, and many of you could go well beyond that. That will be gone forevermore. The resurrection, though, is a game changer. We will have renewed bodies much like the resurrected body of our Lord. Philippians 3, 20 and 21 says, But our citizenship is in heaven, and from it we await a Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ, who will transform our lowly body to be like His glorious body by the power that enables Him even to subject all things to Himself. And I want to stop and encourage you here. Um, it, it's not lost on me that many of you might be suffering with a physical ailment now, a mental ailment now, an emotional ailment now. We were talking about on the way here, in 10,000 years, that will just be a memory. In 10,000 years, that will be a foregone memory of the past that Christ has obliterated with His glorious presence. In the meantime, He calls us to faithfulness and to suffer well. So the early church longed for the return of Christ because sin and Satan, death will be destroyed, will be given resurrected bodies. This is the third reason they long for it. Heaven and earth itself will be rejuvenated, restored, and replenished. A new heaven and a new earth will arise out of the purifying fire of the old earth. Listen to Revelation 21.1. Then I saw a new heaven and a new earth, for the first heaven and the first earth had passed away. God will do to all of creation what he did to Jesus on the third day. This universe is his. This is God's world. And he will redeem it, replenish it, restore it, resurrect it to its beautiful final end. His plan is not to kick this world to junk, to blow it to smithereens, and to have us floating around in the celestial sky. No, beloved, he is going to fix this broken world. He is going to unite both heaven and earth in a marriage like no other. And think about what this means practically. There will be no more devastating hurricanes. There will be no more exploding volcanoes. There will be no more twisting tornadoes. There will be no deadly cancer cells. There will be no more deformity, disability, starvation, mudslides, trash heaps, wildfires, earthquakes, COVID, viruses, pestilence, and all manner of destructive forces that belabor and beguile God's good earth. It will all be gone. Listen to Romans 8, 22 and 23. For we know that the whole creation has been groaning together in the pains of childbirth until now. And not only the creation, but we ourselves, who have the first fruits of the Spirit, groan inwardly as we wait eagerly for our adoption as sons, the redemption of our bodies. We groan living in these non-resurrected bodies, but creation itself is also groaning waiting for its resurrection in the end. I mean, listen to Randy Alcorn here. He says, do you sense creation's restlessness? Do you hear groaning in the cold night wind? Do you feel the forest loneliness, the ocean's agitation? Do you hear longing in the cries of the whales? Do you see blood and pain in the eyes of wild animals? Or the mixture of pleasure and pain in the eyes of your pets? Despite vestiges of beauty and joy, something on this earth is terribly wrong. The creation hopes for, even anticipates, resurrection. So the early church longed for the return of Christ because sin, Satan, and death will be destroyed. The resurrection will occur. And thirdly, all creation, the whole universe, will be restored. The fourth reason, and this is very apropos, justice happens. Justice happens. Listen to Acts chapter 17, verses 30 and 31. The times of ignorance God overlooked, but now he commands all people everywhere to repent because he has fixed a day on which he will judge the world in righteousness by a man whom he has appointed. And of this he has given assurance to all by raising that man from the dead. God's justice may be delayed, but it is never denied. One writer said the will of God's justice grinds 
slow, but it grinds exceedingly fine. One constant promise from Genesis to Revelation is that the world will be judged by God Almighty. Everything that is wrong will be righted and justice will reign supreme. And this is hope sustaining. I mean, when you're watching the news and many times you just become dismayed and discouraged because human courts fail, be encouraged, believer, that the divine court never fails. Guilty people may get away for a time. They may get away and flaunt it right now, but no one will escape the ever-seeing eyes of God Almighty. Listen to Psalm 96, 9 and 13. Worship the Lord in the splendor of His holiness. Tremble before Him all the earth. Say among the nations, the Lord reigns. Yes, the world is established. It shall never be moved. He will judge the peoples with equity. Let the heavens be glad. Let the earth rejoice. Let the sea roar and all that fills it. Let the let the trees of the forest sing for joy before the Lord, for He comes, for He comes to judge the earth. He will judge the world in righteousness and the peoples in His faithfulness. His justice will be an incredibly good thing. He is fixing, redeeming, riding, and reordering the earth. Um, and just an, as an aside, Believers will take part in this judgment. Listen to 1 Corinthians 6 3. This is an astounding verse. It's the only time it's mentioned in the scriptures. Do you not know that we are to judge angels? How much more than matters pertaining to this life? So God will judge the world, will take part in judging the world, will also take part in judging angels. I mean, talk about a lack of qualification on my part. I don't feel qualified for that. And yet the Lord invites his people into it. And I'll say this even Christians will stand before God, but for very different reasons than non-Christians. Unbelievers stand before God and must give an account of why they rejected Jesus, chose sin, and did what they've done. Christians, however, will stand before God and they will have their ministries, their labors for the Lord, and their service judged and justly rewarded based upon their faithfulness. And so I know this is, a, this is an interesting idea, but not only will God judge the world, He will also judge His people. But the manner of the judgment will be different. And I want to say that because you can hear that and anxiety creep up in your heart and mind. Believers do not face the condemnation and wrath of God. And they don't face it because the wrath and condemnation of God has been poured out on Jesus. But we will stand before Him to be judged in order to be rewarded. This is the fifth reason why the early church longed for the return of Christ. We are rewarded, comforted, and vindicated. Christians are rewarded, comforted, and vindicated. Listen to the classic text on this, 1 Corinthians 3, 10, and 15. This is Paul. According to the grace of God given to me, like a skilled master builder, I laid a foundation, and someone else is building upon it. Let each one take care how he builds upon it. For no one can lay a foundation other than that which is laid, which is Jesus Christ. Now if anyone builds on the foundation with gold, silver, precious stones, wood, hay, and straw, each one's work will become manifest. He's talking to believers here. For the day will disclose it, because it will be revealed by fire. And that fire will test what sort of work each one has done. If the work that anyone has built on the foundation survives, he'll receive a reward. If anyone's work is burned up, he will suffer suffer loss, though he himself will be saved, but only as though through fire. And so this passage here is teaching what we've done for the Lord as believers, the life lived, relying on the Spirit, will be tested, weighed, and judged, ultimately with believers receiving varying degrees of rewards in heaven. And so this is, this is interesting, but the New Testament teaches this. At, at this point, some people feel uncomfortable with the idea that there will be degrees of reward or blessedness in heaven. And so, I mean, naturally you think, well, won't we feel like we're lacking if another believer is rewarded differently than we are? And I want to say two things about that very quickly. 
First, every believer will experience the, a full measure of reward and blessedness in heaven. Every believer will be rewarded and every believer will experience the blessedness of heaven. An analogy here will be helpful. It's like if you take a balloon, all right, and you blow the balloon up for 10 seconds. Is the balloon full? Yes. We all would agree the balloon is full of air. If you blow it 20 seconds more, does it become more full? Yes. 30 seconds, more full. 40 seconds, more full. That's the picture of every believer in heaven. Every believer's rewards will be full, but some will be more full based upon their faithfulness to Christ. And so no believer will have a deflated balloon in heaven. (laughs) Every believer will have a balloon and it will be full. But the degree of fullness depends upon their ministries, their faithfulness, their service to the Lord. And secondly, this is the second thing I'll say on this, and this is likely most important. Why do we get upset now when other people have more than us? I mean, you feel what I feel and you feel envious at times when you see other people succeeding or you see other people having more than you. We feel that way because of sin. In heaven, there won't be any sin. And so we will be happy, well, no, we'll be overjoyed that there will be other believers that have more than us in heaven. And a part of our joy will be rejoicing in the joy that they have. And so the picture here, though, is we will be rewarded at the return of Christ, having our ministries, our labors for the Lord, our service for Him judged. But even more importantly for those who are suffering now, we will be comforted at the return of Christ. Listen to Revelation 21.4. God will wipe away every tear from their eyes, and death shall be no more. Neither shall there be mourning, nor crying, nor pain anymore, for the former things have passed away. So we'll be rewarded, but we will be comforted by the presence of King Jesus when he returns. 2 Corinthians 4, 17 and 18, For this light momentary affliction is preparing for us an eternal weight of glory beyond all comparison, as we look not to the things that are seen, but to the things that are unseen. What we go through now, is not only molding and shaping our rewards in heaven, but it's also preparing heaven for us. What we endure, what we triumphantly and patiently suffer with Christ for, shapes our experience of the end. One writer says, They say of some temporal suffering you go through now, no future bliss can make up for it not knowing that heaven once attained will work backwards and turn even that agony into a glory. Now, I want to say publicly, I don't know all of the will of God, but I know that God has a plan, even if we're not privy to all the details. Everything that a believer endures is meaningful. Nothing is wasted. Nothing is for no reason. God allows what he hates to bring about what he loves. And heaven will reveal the reason why his infinite wisdom allowed you to go through certain things. There will be no loose ends, frayed knots, or kinks in the chain once we get to heaven. We will understand it in the by and by, as the hymn says. Listen to this beautiful promise in Matthew 25 and 23. His master said to him, Well done, good and faithful servant. You've been faithful over a little. I will set you over much. Enter into the joy of your master. So we'll be rewarded, comforted, and vindicated at his return. This is the last reason why the early church longed for his return. We will see him face to face. We are with him forever. Jesus will be all in all, unending bliss, eternal happiness, and supreme delight are ours forevermore. I mean, this is what we long for in our best moments, right? Whom have I in heaven but you and earth has nothing our desire besides you. Those are our best moments. But imagine every moment feeling that, enjoying that, delighting in him as you stand before him face to face. 
Listen to Revelation 21, 3. And I heard a loud voice from the throne saying, Behold, the dwelling place of God is with man. He will dwell with them and they will be his people. And God himself will be with them as their God. The very goal of the Bible, to get us to that point. For we now see in a mirror dimly, but then face to face. I know in part, then I shall know fully, even as I have been fully known. I mean, I don't know about you, but I'm excited for heaven. All right? I'm excited to see my father who passed away when I was four. My grandmothers who passed away to be done with the battle of sin, the frustration of brokenness, the sadness of the flesh. I got questions for the Apostle Paul. Peter and others, why they worded things in God's word a certain way. But brothers and sisters, the believer's greatest desire is to see Jesus face to face. Heaven is heaven because Christ is there. Heaven is heaven because you will be with Jesus. It isn't about the streets of gold. It isn't mainly about being reunited with old family members. It isn't about playing celestial golf or having big mansions. It is about being with Christ forevermore. Goodness. I mean, think about this. If you were to offer the saints every joy, every delight, every satisfaction of heaven except for Jesus, heaven itself would become hell. Because the believer's greatest desire is to see Him face to face. To have our faith turned into sight irrevocably and forevermore. One writer said this, not only will we see his face and live, but we will likely wonder if we ever lived before that moment that we saw his face. And I'll say this, when we see him, his gaze will not only be welcoming and gracious towards us, it will literally transform us. 1 John 3 and 2 says, Beloved, we are God's children now, and what we will be has not yet appeared but we know that when He appears, we shall be like Him because we shall see Him as He is. That, that transformation taking place because His glory will be so opulent, so noble, so <laughs> transformative that it will literally change you. And so, brothers and sisters, those are the six reasons, the big reasons, why the early church longed for the return of Christ. Sin, Satan, and death will be no more. The resurrection of the body will occur. Heaven and earth will be rejuvenated, restored, replenished. Justice will happen. We'll be rewarded, comforted, and vindicated. And we will see our King and Master face to face. And so, in conclusion, what do we do with it? It's not enough just to hear it. How do we obey it? How do we obey it? The Word of God. And so I want to leave you with a couple questions, a few questions here. The first question is, how then shall we live? In light of all of that, how then shall we live? That day ought to transform how we live today. Jesus will come bathed in radiant splendor, enveloped within an atmosphere of indescribable brilliance, surrounded by ear-piercing praise of angels and saints, Blinding and brilliant light shining from his eyes. Irresistible power pouring from his hands. None can and will deny his beauty or escape his transforming energy. How then shall we live in light of that? Second question. Who are you living for? Who are you living for? Listen to Randy Alcorn here. In the day that we stand before our master and maker, it will not matter how many people on earth knew our name how many called us great, and how many considered us fools. It will not matter whether schools or hospitals were named after us, whether our estate was large or small, whether our funeral drew 10,000 or no one. It will not matter what the newspapers or history books said or didn't say. What will matter is one thing and one thing only, what the master thinks of us. Who are you living for right now? Third question, what are you living for right now? Do people know that your blessed hope is His return? Or do they think it's your car, your job, your house, your family, your vacations, the weekend, some hobby? The list goes on and on and on. I mean, and y'all, God wants us to enjoy creation. 
I mean, everything is to be received with thanksgiving and prayer. But let us not live in such a way that we're living our best life now. We are called to live our best life later. What are you living for now? Second or uh, fifth question here, what changes do you need to make right now? So get even more practical. So you may see the problem, what people think you're living for. What practical changes do you need to make right now to ensure that people around you know that your blessed hope is Christ? And then lastly, are you ready for the return of the King? Are you living in light of that day? Are you prepared to stand before Him? 1 Corinthians 2 9 here says, But as it is written, what no eye has seen, nor ear heard, nor the heart of man imagined, what God has prepared for those who love Him. Are you ready for it, believer, to stand before Him? Whether you stand before Him because you pass away, or you stand before Him because He returns in two weeks, are you ready for that day? And I will say this, if you are not a believer, you are most certainly not ready for that day. Because in that day, the age of opportunity has passed. And you cannot accept God's free offer of salvation. You cannot appropriate what He has done for us and our salvation when He splits the skies. At that point, faith has given way to sight, and what's done has been made known. And so if you're not a believer in the room, I beckon you, Christ could come tomorrow. Accept Him now. Receive Him as Lord, as Savior, as Master, and as Treasure. And I, I remember who it was. One, one writer said, I, I don't want you to accept Christ because you may die tomorrow. I want you to accept Christ because you may live today. And walking with Him today makes quite a difference. Are you ready for His return? Let's pray. Father, we praise you. We praise you for what you have declared that you will do. We praise you that this is sure, that your words are true, that you never lie, that you make promises that are enduring and that cannot pass away because your character is firm. And so, Lord, we pray that you would fight for us Fight for us not to coast through this life, not to be, be drifting uh, in a numb or senseless uh, way, but God, that we would be intentionally pursuing you, pursuing your kingdom, focusing on what you've done for us and our salvation. God, we pray that we would tell others about your return, that we would not, <laughs> and I don't mean that we'd be frantic or we'd be Chicken Little out there saying the sky is falling, God, but we would have a steady trust proclaiming the return of the King, which is sure. And so, God, help us just, just not to hear this and have head knowledge, but, Lord, to be found faithful, to obey Your Word, to live accordingly in light of Your glorious, bodily, majestic return. Lord, help us where we fail You. Forgive us, empower us to be obedient. And, God, be all in all in our midst. And we pray this in Jesus' mighty and precious name. Amen.